What's the first memory that you have? There's two. One, a German Shepherd tied up to a swing set that was a mean dog trying to bite kids and thanking God there was a chain. And the other one was me being tied to a bed as a kid by one of my arms. And then, um, you know, the abuse that came after that. I'm a middle child. So, you know, I used humor as a coping mechanism, trying to defuse what's the next drama, try to use humor to kind of get things to calm down. So those early years between three and seven was when the worst abuse and, you know, the professionals call it torture, uh, happened to me as a kid. And so whether it was being dunked in a tub till I passed out or being electrocuted, it was all very intentional. You know, I thank God uh, that he kept me alive to be able to not only tell my story in a way that's redemptive, but give other people hope, including children, both here in the U.S. and around the world. My biological dad had left us before I was born. I think I did 14 schools and lived in 17 houses. So moving was just, just a normal thing for us. I mean, I know all things work together for good uh, to those who love Christ. And, and I wasn't in love with him yet, so I couldn't understand really how this was gonna be beneficial yet. It's, it's hard when you move somewhere, when kids have been raised together and you're the new guy. So, you know, I started drinking and doing drugs again. I'd stop, but I started again. And, uh, you know, it was just leading me down a path of emptiness. I remember I did it not to kind of be cool or fit in. I actually did it because I, I was hurting a lot. I didn't want to remember. But, you know, that's the problem with drugs. They're an alcohol. They're good for the moment. They are, or people wouldn't do it. The problem is it just complicates things. I mean, from a young child, I always believed in Jesus. We were born Catholic, raised Baptist, did Pentecostal stuff for a while, charismatic. I knew about Jesus, always believed in God. God to me, though, was a very distant taskmaster, you know, because people refer to him as the God the Father, which is offensive because I was like, well, fathers I've known are absent, angry, drunkards, violent abusive. So I couldn't really relate to God, didn't necessarily want to, but his son Jesus, all the Sunday school stories I heard were great. I mean, he loved the little children. He, I don't know, he, he did supernatural things. I realized he had to be alive one night. And it was, uh, I think it was around 10 years old. Our stepfather, the one that was most abusive, he had come home drunk came into the house, had his gun out, and he started shooting lights on the outside of the house. So my mother took us and the kids, we ran and hid in the closet. And he came back to that back room and said, you know, come out or I'm coming in. And my mother started praying in Jesus' name. She said, the blood of Jesus covers the door. The blood of Jesus covers the door. And I was thinking, Mom, Jesus is a nice guy, but you know, he's, he's not the, we need somebody strong. We need like a Rambo Jesus, right? Not this, you know, kind, compassionate. He's not going to stop that evil man. But that was the night I, man, that was the night I realized Jesus Christ is extremely powerful. And um, our stepfather couldn't come into the room with an open door. Physically, he was restrained. We don't, the only way to say it is that the prayer worked. And then he went and passed out in his bedroom and we escaped that night through a window and that room never came back. I would get out of the Marines in 1986 at the end, but at that point I had tried everything. I was doing everything this world told me I had to do, fight, drink, chase skirt, but I was still very empty. And at that point, you know, it seems like everything that was planted in me these seeds of uh, God and Christ and salvation and hope, you know, it, it made me start, 
And I should probably work on my spiritual part because I knew as a person, I was a physical being, spiritual and mental, right? To try to figure out myself, my identity as a man. And yet I was really unfulfilled and empty. I get a snail mail from my biological dad. I still have the letter today. He addressed the letter to me as dear son, and it made me mad. I, I mean, I'll never forget opening it. Dear son, I thought, son, you, you got my mom pregnant and you've never been a dad to me. Don't call me son. I remember being so, so offended. And then he apologized for not being a dad. In so many words, I was like, all right. And then he said, I know you think I'm crazy. And I'm thinking, yes, yes you are. And he went on to say, I'm crazy, but this time for Jesus Christ. And I went, wow. Um, and even though the letter was pretty convincing, I still was like, what is his angle? Why, why is he trying to, what does he need from me? And he asked me, hey, would you come down and visit me? So I took leave of absence from the Marine Corps, went down back to Louisiana. There was something different about him. I remember thinking, there's a niceness to you that uh, versus just this raw guy. He asked me, you know, would you want to go to church? I went to church and I, it was the worship music I think that got me the most. Listening to people worship God and then hearing how much God loved me. Christ's death on the cross was specifically for me. And the thing that I struggled with as much as I hated other people and I let my heart turn hard, I realized, man, I've done wrong. I was ready to be forgiven and to surrender my life for a greater purpose than anything I could ever think of. It wasn't until that summer, 1986, of my biological dad, me seeing a visible change in this man's life. Something was different. Him inviting me to church and me hearing just good worship music and a simple message. That's, that's when the change happened. That was my day that I actually believe I became a man. Getting out the Marine Corps, I need a mission and God had already prepared one for me. When ISIS invaded Iraq, it started killing, beheading, and taking young women, even kids for sex trafficking. And we had an invitation to go by the Kurdistan Regional Government through a friend and put together a team to help a number of girls who had been held captive by ISIS, who all they wanted to do was die. We put a team together, flew there and hit the ground running. And what that did for us was show us how great the need was and gave us a love for Arabs, Muslims, Yazidi, whoever was in the region, especially for their children. When wars and the evil things happen, the children always the one that suffer the most. People say, well, you risk those lives going over there. Yeah, we do. But if I'm in the center of God's will, is it my business how I go home or not?